Hello, and welcome to today's event, Then and Now, the Importance of Historically Informed Approaches to Addressing Racial Health Inequities and in Responding to COVID-19. At the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, we do a lot of events on health policy issues. We're a university-wide Duke program that aims to develop and use evidence-based approaches to improve health, health equity, and the value of health care for all through policy reforms. But this event, this event is special. It's been entirely developed and managed by this year's cohort of Margolis scholars who come from all parts of the university, brought together by their commitment to make a difference through evidence-based health policy. And I also wanna thank all of our impressive panelists for their participation on a topic that couldn't be more timely and one where we need better policy actions. Today, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky stated that racism is a serious public health threat that directly affects the well being of millions of Americans. This declaration is not a new finding. She highlighted a wide range of evidence on how racism affects health through such areas as structural barriers related to the major social determinants of health, and right up to the striking and continuing racial and ethnic disparities and the impact of the COVID 19 pandemic. What a year it's been for underscoring the importance of these topics. So the challenge for all of us involved in developing evidence and analysis to guide policy is, what are the most effective strategies to undertake and how do we know? We oppose racism and we aim to advance health equity. How do we translate that not only into action in our own daily lives and activities, but in developing, implementing, assessing and improving key policy reforms to have a meaningful impact on racism and its consequences for health equity. Today's event will examine three aspects of COVID that present opportunities to do this. Equitable vaccine distribution, social contributors of health, and healthcare delivery changes moving forward. This intersects with and should inform some major activities at the Duke Margolis Center. For example, we've recently issued collaborative reports on promising steps that states are taking to improve vaccination equity and on federal and state policies to advance public-private collaboration on vaccinations including effective ways to support healthcare providers, health plans, and community-based organizations in improving access to vaccination. And we're supporting public-private initiatives involving the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and healthcare payers to prioritize, measure, and implement payment reforms to address key health inequities. All of our efforts and those of others require intentional thinking to make sure we're approaching these issues inclusively and effectively. And for those of you who are interested after this event, I encourage you to go to our website. You can find out more both about our activities and opportunities to collaborate. Today, each panel will address the history of medical racism, including interpersonal, institutional, and systemic racism that has led to the medical system losing the trust of many Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities nationwide. And the panels will explore how to use this history to inform current efforts and current policies to respond to COVID, hopefully leading to more informed and effective policy interventions. So thanks for joining. And now I'd like to turn this over to Elaine and Josie to begin the panel on equitable vaccine distribution. Thanks so much, Mark. Hi, everyone. My name is Elaine Wynn, and I'm a Margolis Scholar and third year law student at the Duke University School of Law. Um, I'll be co-moderating our panel on equitable vaccine distribution along with Josie. Thanks for introducing me, Elaine. My name is Josie. I am currently a sophomore undergraduate Margolis Scholar, majoring in a self-designed program to studying global disability and health policy. And I'm really excited to be moderating with Elaine today as I've interacted with some of these panelists before. Um, so I guess I will pass it off to Elaine to get our introduction started. Sure. First, I'll introduce our first panelist, Dr. Viviana Martinez Bianchi. Um, she's an associate professor and the director of health equity for the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at Duke Health. Uh, clinically, Dr. Martinez Bianchi practices the full spectrum of ambulatory family medicine. Um, she's passionate about health equity and addressing social determinants of health. Uh, locally, she's collaborated on various initiatives to improve health equity in Durham and across the state of North Carolina, most recently in response to COVID-19. Um, she's a founding member and co-director of Latin 19, the Latinx advocacy team and inter interdisciplinary network for COVID-19. Um, she received her medical training at the National University of Rosario Faculty of Medicine in Argentina and trained in family medicine at the University of uh, Iowa. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. Uh, Martinez-Biaki. 
Our second panelist is Andrea Toomey. Andrea Toomey serves as a Health Equity Policy Fellow at Duke Margolis. At the center, she is involved in enhancing policy analysis, research in education, health equity, anti-racism, and health disparities. Her research interests include addressing structural policies, systemic barriers, and social determinants of health that create health inequities among the Latino or Latinx community in the US and among women in accessing reproductive health prevention, screening, and treatment globally. She also serves as a course instructor on Bass Connections courses and is a research collaborator with Latin 19 Radix Up and Women Inspired Strategies for Healthcare. Prior to joining Duke Margolis, she was a research associate at the Brookings Institute and senior analyst at PricewaterhouseCoopers. She has consulted for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization, and World Bank. She holds an MSc in Health Policy, Planning, and Financing from the London School of Economics and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, a Master in Public Policy from the McCourt School of Public Policy, Georgetown University, and a BA in Community Health and International Relations from Tufts University. Um, thank you so much, Andrea, for joining us today. Great. And our final panelist is Lavinia uh, Asudivan. Um, Dr. Asudivan is an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health in the Global Health Institute at Duke. Uh, she's also a member of the Duke Human Vaccine Institute and a faculty affiliate with the Center for Health Policy and Inequalities Research. Uh, her research focuses on studying the timeliness of vaccinations, um, identifying vaccination barriers, and understanding the role of misinformation in driving vaccine hesitancy. Um, Dr. Basu Deven uh, completed her doctoral training in molecular biology and genetics at Cornell and received her MPH from the John Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. All right, thank you guys so much for being here. And uh, I think Josie will start. Yes, so we just wanted to address all three panelists to start out. Um, and we wanted to ask you if each of you would like to add a brief overview of your experiences in researching or working with vaccine access during COVID or otherwise. So if I may, I can start. Um, as you mentioned, as Elaine mentioned earlier, I'm a family doctor. Uh, as a family medicine doctor, I have been involved in vaccination access, education, and provision of vaccines to my patients throughout my 30 year career, um, especially with information about new vaccines, listen, listening to people's concerns, making sure they vaccinate themselves or their children. Um, so this has always been a priority in my practice. Now with the pandemic, I'm very concerned about vaccine equity in the state of North Carolina, the country and the world, specifically when we talk about historically marginalized populations who lag behind significantly behind receiving their COVID-19. Um, the pandemic highlighted wide inequities in access and information about not just the vaccines, but testing and care for COVID. And that was the reason for funding uh, Latin 19. I'm, I'm working in this interdisciplinary network to really address it, wide inequities. So uh, I'll be happy to go next. So I've also been working on a few projects at Duke Marvelous on vaccine access and testing um, since the beginning of the pandemic. So um, a couple that I wanted to highlight. One, uh, since November, we started convening uh, monthly meetings with governor-appointed COVID-19 health equity task forces. And so these are um, about 10 states or so to facilitate the sharing of best practices, understanding their challenges, and, and providing resources as well to, um, to these groups among the, the state leaders. Uh, recently, as part of that work, uh, which uh, Mark referred to, we uh, released a brief last week that was highlighting uh, illustrative best practices from over 20 states on uh, their strategies on data access and uh, supporting community leadership as well to reduce the, the racial and ethnic disparities that we are seeing in the vaccination rates. Um, I've also been really fortunate to uh, work with Viviana closely uh, on Latin 19, and we've been doing a lot of work, um, not just on vaccinations, but also on community-based mobile testing uh, in Durham as well. I also forgot to mention the role that we have held several members of our Duke community and others have held with the historically marginalized uh, uh, team within the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, really truly 
deeply informing policy. We have several of our Morgolis Best Connection students also involved with the historically marginalized populations team as well. So it has been a, a real opportunity for both members of our Duke faculty and students to participate in the state's efforts. Great. Hi, everyone. First of all, I want to thank um, Elaine and Josie for the kind introduction and for the invitation today. Um, I'll just say briefly that for the last 10 years, uh, my research has been focused on studying immunization demand, equity, and acceptance. Um, so many of my projects primarily focus on vaccines that are recommended in early childhood and adolescence, but many of the lessons that are learned from vaccinating those populations are transferable, of course, to, to COVID-19 vaccination programs. Um, with respect to COVID specifically, I'm collaborating with a number of faculty on the research side, trying to understand how people are making decisions about um, accepting the COVID-19 vaccines. And this includes um, studies that are being done in um, pregnant women, among healthcare employees. And then this is in addition to ongoing research that I already have um, with the historically marginalized populations. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, our first set of questions are going to be addressing the, the question of ensuring access um, to the vaccines. Uh, Viviana, would you mind discussing the barriers you've seen locally to vaccine information and access? Um, for example, linguistic and cultural accessibility barriers for those who do not speak English as a first language, as one example. Yes, so barriers to vaccine education and access are many. Starting with education, there are language barriers. There's not enough information in a clear language in the languages of the different populations that live in our state, our country, and the world even. Um, and there's also divisive the rhetoric, re rhetoric regarding the vaccines and lack of belief in science has, that has actually impacted the public health uh, messaging um, and even the efforts, even the efforts that have clear language are having to fight uh, or the clear language of vaccines is unable to mitigate the aggressive anti-vaccination propaganda. Right? Even uh, small amounts of side effects or problems get uh, magnified and, and, and we start losing the picture on, on, on the importance of vaccination to really prevent further spread. Um, the infodemia is really impacting public health. Um, lack of public health funding has impacted the deployment of messages at, at the community level in the language of community members. Now we have to remember that the CARES Act proposes that insurance, um, that the, the vaccine is free for all, but there are pre-existing uh, ways of flows that are actually getting in the way. So even though the vaccination is free, insurance may be billed, an administration fee, but no payment is supposed to be required of the person getting the vaccine. But when people start, in, start seeing that message, they get confused and they're thinking, well, if I go, then I'm going to get a bill. Well, the, your insurance is gonna get a bill, but what if I don't have insurance? So there's a lot of unclari a lack of clarity with that. Workflows are always recurring, IDs and proof of insurance. And even though, uh, even though our own state is saying you do not need to require an ID or proof of insurance, and in some cases, even social security numbers, this is linked to our lack of universal health access, right? If we had universal health access, if we didn't have to request people's insurance, check cards, et cetera, to access healthcare, we wouldn't be having to redesign flows in this flow, uh, flows of how to access the vaccine in this moment. So there's a lot of confusion in that um, that I'm seeing. Uh, and, and then in barriers of, of access is that excessive reliance of an electronic ways to register. And I think that's another question that you want to address later, but the language is key and language is power. And if you speak a language that is not the dominating language of where all the distribution and access is um, organized, then it becomes much more difficult for a person to, to get access. And the same with electron, the overly significant reliance of electronic media. Thank you so much for that great insight. Um, and then shifting over to another perspective, Andrea, um, we were wondering, given your background and experience, how do you think we should balance the need to deliver vaccines as quickly as possible um, with the tiered approach we've seen used here in the US? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really great question. So I do want to just take a step back and you know acknowledge the 
the systemic inequities that we have seen among Black, Indigenous, and Latino or Latinx populations who have really borne the, um, you know, the impact of COVID-19, whether we're talking risk of exposure, transmission, case rates, severity of, of illness, mortality, um, you know, even among younger populations, uh, for example, um, these inequities are really stark. And, you know, especially when you're considering who is dying and who's contracting COVID uh, due to factors outside of their control, whether it's their, their work, if they're an essential worker, or um, you know, the, the patterns of systemic exclusion that, that Viviana just uh, discussed that doesn't make health system infrastructure that is available accessible to, to all populations. Um, and I just wanted to highlight too, so the most recent uh, data from the Kaiser uh, Family Foundation this week actually is noting that um, the, the trends of inequitable vaccination rates are continuing, unfortunately, even though they have um, reduced slightly. But one example um, you know, is uh, taking California where half, um, half of the, the mortality rates in COVID-19 are among the Latino or Latinx population yet less than a quarter of, of Latinos have, have received um, the, the vaccine to date. And so this inequity is really why it's important for the, the US to balance equity and speed uh, to ensure that access um, and uptake uh, is not just by all populations, but really um, you know, by the populations that, that are bearing this burden of COVID-19. Um, and many states are, 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 well, the states and the federal government are doing a lot of work in this. And so there have been efforts to, to achieve this dual goal, both uh, in terms of on the federal side, um, through programs like the Community Health Centers Vaccination Program and the Federal Retail Pharmacy Program and FEMA sites. But states have also been doing a lot in terms of implementing approaches um, to not only increase allocation and the availability, but also more critically, how to increase accessibility. And that's where I think this balance has to come into play of, you know, you need to have a multi-pronged approach that addresses uh, availability, allocation, and accessibility. Um, so things like now, you know, until recently, um, eligibility, for example, uh, across states was not um, uniformly including groups. Um, that are disproportionately represented by Black, Indigenous, or, or Latino or Latinx populations. Um, but now that has extended or will be extended very soon, um, which this is a, a needed step, but additional intentional strategies, uh, which we'll go into, I think, in, uh, later in the discussion that remove those barriers for accessibility will, uh, will need to continue, um, but also amplify. And I think that's where um, you know, this effort will, will need to come together. Um, but again, this multi-pronged approach would be, would be how um, the balance, I think, can be achieved. Great, thank you so much, Andrea. Um, Lavinia, uh, just like Andrea just mentioned, we've seen um, these same type of racial inequities globally when it comes to the vaccine rollout. Uh, what do you think are some key issues with ensuring global access to the vaccine? Yeah, that's a great question. And the, the issues surrounding global access to COVID-19 vaccines are, are complicated because there are numerous historical and political influences at play. Um, for most of you who are familiar with um, uh, the smallpox eradication campaign um, back in the 1970s and the expanded program of immunization, know that vaccination coverage in the developing world has increased by leaps and bounds. And I'm talking specifically about childhood vaccinations. Um, but what that means is that except for vaccinating pregnant women, adult vaccination programs are virtually non-existent um, in many countries. Um, I think on the plus side, you know, several developing countries have experience uh, conducting mass national vaccination campaigns. And that's going to be a plus when they are looking at scaling COVID-19 vaccinations. But on the flip side, you know, there are several challenges. So in our research, we constantly uncover um, disparities, specifically rural urban disparities and disparities based on social determinants of health, um, where you know, um, wealthier and more urban located families are more likely to have access to vaccines um, as compared to those who are um, poorer or live in, in more rural settings. And then we're talking also about vulnerable populations, refugees, immigrants, um, and people living in areas of conflict. Um, and so there are some unique challenges with respect to geography. We also routinely encounter in our research um, challenges with respect to vaccine storage. 
um, especially in rural areas where there aren't reliable, where there isn't a reliable supply of electricity or gas to run refrigerators. So when we are thinking about vaccine candidates that can be used internationally, some of these considerations pose great challenges in, in terms of which vaccines can be used. And I think the biggest problem that we have right now is related to vaccine supply. And we are seeing large global in inequities in terms of which countries have access to the supply. Um, in February, for instance, UNICEF reported that um, 130 countries, mostly low and middle income countries, were yet to begin vaccinating people. Um, and although some of those countries have started receiving vaccines through COVAX, so the supply is really, really limited at present. Um, and these are the same countries that are now being threatened um, with virus variants and, and are seeing great surges in the cases of COVID-19. And I, I think this only adds to the urgency of vaccinating the developing world. Um, so ultimately, I think unless we overcome some of these challenges with supply and storage and um, reducing disparities, um, we, we risk dragging out the pandemic for several years. Great, thank you so much. Um, at this time, we would also like to move on to our next topic, which is community partnership. As all of our panelists have had experiences in vaccine distribution, both locally and globally. And as Andrea had discussed previously, we've seen that COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on Black, Latinx, and Indigenous populations here in the U.S. And this um, traces back to our pre-existing health disparities that we've seen before. And um, these racial disparities do continue into vaccine rollout. So globally, we've seen striking disparities in vaccine distribution between wealthier countries and countries with fewer resources. And so to all of our panelists, can you comment on how you partner with and engage communities in your target settings to conduct research or deliver healthcare? So some of the, the ways that, that we engage is, um, first you need, you need to, to work with trusted community-based organizations and, and, and trusted members of the community um, that can help to mitigate that excessive reliance or, of, on electronic ways to register the marginalized populations, right? We, we often see that who has had access are those who are very connected, who already have privilege. And we, we, we need to start thinking about that marginalization that occurs when we are over-reliant on technology. Um, so by working together with community diverse organizations that can, they can create the lists of people, you know, directly saying, call this number, and then they enter in them in those lists. We, we have done some great partnerships with churches, with um, community organizations that are not faith-based, et cetera. One of the things that we are still seeing is that we are then counting with their tremendous amount of hours of work without payment for those to those community organizations. We, we are relying on that volunteer workforce um, to do the work that perhaps uh, the, the large organization that held the funding could, didn't know how to do because we're not need really that connected into communities. So we, we, we've, we're seeing approaches that work that, um, in order to vaccine, uh, increase vaccine access, we can do pop-up clinics in spaces that are trusted by the community, clinic events in churches, in gyms, in schools, in people's neighborhoods, places that require pre-registration, but the registration is, that by, is done by the community. But it would also be great if we did not require pre-registration. We often are seeing at, at every pop-up event, and I've been part of the organization of those, that people show up and, oh, they didn't pre-register, therefore you cannot get a vaccine. We need to start thinking beyond this. They, they showed up and want a vaccine. They're pro from the neighborhood there. Let's get the vaccine to them. Uh, and I do know that there are some logistic issues, especially when it comes to refrigeration, et cetera, but, but planning ahead and thinking uh, together with our community, you have registered 200, you think there are gonna be 20, 30, 50 that may show up without registration are some of the models that I see in working. Um, the other model is an established site that is open into the evening and on weekends and that the appointments are, are, 
are saved for those historically marginalized populations. Uh, for example, we just started the new Wheels Fun Park in Durham on Hoover Road and is run by Duke Health um, and the Durham Health Department. And we, with Latin 19 and other organizations, were able to secure a thousand appointments per week, per week, save for the Latinx community. And we connected with uh, community-based organizations for them to directly register people. Um, so that is actually showing that we can increase the number of people accessing those vaccines. But at the same time, what we're not looking into yet, and I want us to start thinking is, how do we fund the community-based organizations that are doing so much work at the ground level who will really benefit also in their um, sustainability and, 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 and economic security to actually be funded for all this work that they are doing? And I just wanted to build a little bit on, on, on the work um, that Viviana has described through Latin 19. One of the other strategies too has been building on the infrastructure that was set up for testing. And so, you know, using that existing infrastructure and those partnerships, but also um, like one of the strategies actually that, that we identified that worked well for testing was partnering, um, coupling testing with other needs of the community. So things like food distribution, um, you know, given the, the food insecurity that, that has increased um, during COVID-19, you know, addressing these other, um, you know, these other issues that, that um, are, are very present and very real. And so that's, I think, um, you know, another way that, that we have found in terms of partnering. Um, and then to the point on the, you know, not having um, all of this be done by, by community organizations, definitely, I think, you know, health equity has to be a multi-sector um, approach that is taken on by, by all sectors, whether that's the, um, the public sector and private sector. And so we're also doing work at Margolis that's looking at public-private partnerships in the space, um, and we'll be releasing some work soon. But I think that that's another uh, area too, of you know, both increasing the funding to community-based uh, organizations to fund that, that time that, you know, as, as Viviana was saying, is already being spent and all that labor that's, that's already being done but also identifying other opportunities for, um, for partnerships so that then you know, equity is not just taken on, on by, um, by community-based organizations. It should be led by community-based organizations, but it has to be a sector-wide um, solution. I, I may also, I want to also add that I think I'm very thankful also to the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services for thinking as a policy approach to actually require that vendors or vaccinators do an equity look, right? And so what, what is happening is that every health system, every um, pharmacy provider of vaccines has to look at, the, at, at an equity number. And so for example, if 14% of the population of your county happens to be um, Latino, then 14% of your vaccines should be going to the Latino community. Is 40% of the community is African American, 40% of your vaccines should be going to the Af African American community. And then they had also provided with a, a, a account of equity deficit. So, for example, if you are now that your vaccine distribution has been minus 10% for the Latino community and your community is 14% Latino, now you have to start thinking that 24% of your vaccines should be going to the Latino community. And if you're at minus 22% for the African-American community vaccination efforts you've done, and they are 40% of your community, right now, 64% of your vaccines should be going, or 68% of those vaccines should be going to that community. So it's, it's really, I think that type of uh, metric that the Department of Health and Human Services is providing is really a good way for allowing all of us to start looking at the distribution of vaccines with an equity approach. Yeah, Andrea and Viviana have touched upon some great points with respect to um, vaccine equity and distribution. I'll just speak briefly um, from my experience working internationally. Um, where it has been really critical for us to engage stakeholders from not just the national, um, regional, and local vaccination programs, but also health providers and community leaders um, when we are thinking about potential interventions to promote vaccinations. Um, and we have learned that it's, it's vital to include these stakeholders and community leaders 
um, from the very start of the, the intervention development process. So we've done, you know, we've included qualitative work where we go about testing messages and um, actually all the intervention components with them, trying to understand the relevance and, and cultural appropriateness of things. Um, but we've also found that this exercise is very important um, to ensure um, successful implementation. And so this is something that we have done again and again. And similarly in the US where we are, um, we have a study now uh, looking at HPV vaccination uptake in rural North and South Carolina. We have found it really helpful to engage um, local stakeholders from the rural counties and we are planning a school-based intervention. So the insights that you get um, are really, really valuable. Um, and so that's been one of the key, key things that we've been working on. Um, in the global context, you know, we often face challenges with respect to resource limitations. So oftentimes the interventions that we want to do, we cannot do because the resources are not available. And sometimes the capacity to implement that, that research or, or intervention is not available. So another thing that we have to keep in mind is to be able to assess the capacity and resources ahead of time, make sure that the intervention or messaging or program that we are developing actually matches the resources and capacity that's available. And if needed, develop training programs to build capacity or make those additional resources available as we are trying to implement them. Great, thank you so much. Um, at this point, we wanna see if there are any questions from the audience. I believe you can just unmute to uh, ask or you can type in the Q&A box, which we've, um, oh yes, I'm sorry, just put it in the Q&A box, uh, which we've been monitoring. So please let us know. Um, and if not, we, we do have more questions for our, our experts here, but uh, definitely use that box down below. Um, not seeing anything coming just yet. So I'll ask one more question while we monitor that. Uh, we are curious about um, any developments you all have seen on innovative delivery of vaccines. Uh, have, have you seen any new techniques that have come up um, that have proven most beneficial in increasing access uh, in, in all of your the settings you've looked at? So I, I, I can start with that one, but um, I think one of the most beneficial modes of vaccines have actually been, it's less about the innovative model and more about using a combination of, of strategies that really address that differential access to, to vaccines that, that individuals are facing. So, um, you know, things like, and to what Viviana was talking about earlier, um, you know, the, the reduced access to pharmacies and transportation, the lower access to Wi-Fi uh, for online uh, registration. On the partnership side with employers, having paid time off to be able to actually go get the vaccine when you are able to find an appointment. So, you know, things like, um, you know, strategies that have really encompassed doing, you know, providing information about the vaccine, having that reserve, um, you know, re ability to reserve or help with, with the registration. Um, and I think also very importantly, hosting clinics that are easily accessible within the community, but also um, organized and, and including vaccine administrators who are from that community, both from a, a cultural and linguistic aspect, right? Because I think that also having, um, having that concordance between the physician, uh, sorry, the, the vaccine administrator and the community is really important. And, and it also offers an opportunity to provide more information. And we've seen that actually, you know, with the vaccination events at Latin 19 as well of, you know, there will be some times when, when individuals will come up and, and, you know, just, they don't have, they haven't had, um, you know, a chance to really talk through their concerns. Uh, about getting the vaccine, but then in being there and being in a welcoming environment with, um, with individuals uh, who um, culturally know their concerns and are also uh, you know, able to, to convey that, I think has really helped. Um, and, you know, and I think you know, the, in addition to those community-led strategies, so there have been, um, you know, again, on the state side also, um, uh, you know, reduction of, of other barriers. So things like you know, removing, um, removing requirements for proof of, of identification or uh, increasing funding for, for transportation. Again, trying to you know, address all of these, these access issues that are um, multi-pronged. Multi so I think that, that's what I would say is, has been the most, quote, innovative, even though you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's tools that, that we already had, but it was uh, pulling everything together. I, I think one model that we haven't done enough of is uh, mobile test, mobile vaccination units. 
just as we pretty much fail with mobile testing units in several parts of the country and our, our, even our own county here, is, is the idea of taking the effort to where the community is, right? Finding out, you know, that's this employer, they have, you know, 200 employees, they're really eager to get their employees vaccinated. Can we just bring the vaccines to them as opposed to having them have to go somewhere else? Um, we, we are in places where this is happening, there is a lot of acceptance. One of the issues that has concerned me a lot has been a lot of the conversation about hesitation. And to date, to this point, I have seen less hesitation and more about access, right? Well, I know we're going to get to the point where we're going to see, especially for historically marginalized populations, more hesitation, but we still haven't finished with those who are really, really eager to get the vaccine and don't know where to go. And I think part of it's also kind of a, a vicious cycle where if you don't see anybody that looks like you or no one in your family has, has gotten vaccinated, you're less likely to trust that the vaccine is okay for you. And so we, we have to really figure out access first, making sure it's there at the community, done just like Andrea was just mentioning with all of these factors of, of we need to become trusted members of the community or, or employ trusted members of the community in the vaccine distribution so that then more people in those historically marginalized populations are going to see that people that look like them or part of their community are getting the vaccine and then be more likely to also want to have it. Yeah, and I, I can speak about that. I, I see a few really interesting questions in the in the Q and A, and I can I can um, speak to that a little bit maybe. Um, in terms of you know people have already had COVID nineteen, I think the recommendation still is to go ahead and vaccinate. And you may have seen studies um, that are coming out in terms of the um, effect that COVID nineteen vaccines have, especially for long haulers, um, and there seems to be some benefit to vaccinating. So I think. There's a lot that needs to be researched in terms of um, outcomes for those who already have had COVID-19. But I think the current recommendation is to vaccinate even those who have had COVID-19 in the past. Um, and this is a really interesting question in terms of, you know, are there ways in which we can help countries who don't have enough resources or time to develop vaccines to produce their own vaccines? And I think the challenge here is that we are dealing with a pandemic. So most of what we are doing is reactive. And I would say, you know, as we are thinking about um, getting out of this pandemic and uh, preparing for the next one, you know, setting up mechanisms where we can much more rapidly and equitably scale vaccine manufacturing would be really important. Um, I think we can produce enough supply eventually that can be distributed globally. Um, but you know, you may have seen challenges with vac vaccine nationalism and um, rich countries not potentially contributing to the COVAX initiative, for instance. So I think we need um, countries to, to share vaccines at this point. I think it's, it may be um, too difficult to scale manufacturing at this point. Um, I will also mention, I know Viviana touched upon this issue of misinformation and, and trust in the past. And there's some interesting things that we hear when, when we um, work in some of these countries where, you know, oftentimes there's a perception that vaccines that are developed in some of the, the richer countries are, are quote unquote better quality than vaccines that are developed um, locally. And sometimes it's the reverse where people often trust the vaccines that are developed in their own country and, and mistrust uh, vaccines that are developed um, in other countries. So I think there are all these other factors that also uh, play a role, but Specifically, specifically in terms of vaccine manufacturing, absolutely, we have to identify ways in which manufacturing can be scaled up really quickly um, in the context of the next pandemic. Fantastic. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Unfortunately, we have to wrap it up um, now due to time and move on to the next panel. Uh, but thank you so much. We've learned so much. And um, please check out their bios uh, on the website to, to learn more. All right. Have a great day.
Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Emily Pierce. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a first year medical student at Duke. I'm excited to welcome our incredible, our incredible panelists to the social contributors of health section of our event today. Um, I'll begin by asking our panelists to briefly introduce themselves by saying your name, your pronouns if you're comfortable, and your current job position or school program. And Dr. Nieves Lopez, um, if you're comfortable with starting, we can start with you. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? Uh, my name is Dr. Edith Nieves Lopez. I am a pediatrician at Lincoln Community Health Center in Durham, which is a safety net um, healthcare center. Um, I've been working there for most through the whole pandemic, and I have 10 years of experience working in different settings, FQICs, um, private practice. So I have a bit of knowledge from everywhere. Hi everyone, my name is Oni Ohamadike. I am a current third year uh, medical student and one of the co-presidents of Duke Student National Medical Association or SNMA as it's more uh, commonly known. Um, I'm excited to kind of be here today and share a little bit about uh, my experiences in the community with working with some of um, with Duke SNMA as well as with the uh, local NMA chapters um, and um, working with our communities, not only in COVID testing, but in vaccines as well. Hi everyone, my name is Carly Eckert. I am a preventive medicine physician and epidemiologist and a Duke grad. Um, I work at Greenlight here locally as the um, chief clinical officer, and we um, get to work with local organizations around uh, the COVID response. So great to be here. Griselda Alonso, would you mind sharing um, your name, your pronouns, if you're comfortable, um, and your current position? Yes. Uh, hi. My name, hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Griselda Alonso. I am community organizer for almost 15 years and also uh, as a co uh, community health worker. Uh, I am on document. I'm here uh, to express and to share my experience with my community. Thank all four of you for being here today. We really appreciate it. Um, I'll start a bit by talking about the social contributors of health this past year. Um, so what is one social contributor of health that you've seen be exasperated by the pandemic in this past year alone? Do you want me to start? Yeah, whoever is comfortable with starting, go for it. Um, one of the you know social determinants that was before the pandemic, I mean, it was access to health care, and that was determined by social strata. So income inequalities lead to inequalities in healthcare access. I think that's at the root of a lot of issues, which is if you're not insured, you know, chance of getting medical care were very difficult before the pandemic, and they have exacerbated at this point. I'd have to agree and see that um, access is probably one of the biggest contributors that I think has been um, highlighted, if anything, in this time during the pandemic, as far as the inequalities that is, exist. Um, and we see different um, dimensions of access kind of being exacerbated or at least being more pronounced among different communities. Um, I think one of the most shocking things that I got to witness, not only as a medical student on the wards and just seeing how, um, you know, the effect of the pandemic also heightens um, a lot of the other disparities that are seen in other um, health conditions as people weren't able to get treatment for pre-existing con conditions uh, before or outside of the pandemic. And then just seeing how barriers and access um, exacerbated or like made those problems, um, those disparities even greater. Yeah, to, I think to continue with access, I mean, we've also seen the disproportionate impact of COVID on certain communities, on these communities who've already you know, had these issues with access. And so that's only, um, you know, really worsened things also out of um, concerns about 
you know, interacting with the health system during this time, which a lot of people have felt as well. So it's um, continued to exacerbate some of the issues. Uh, something that affects a lot of my community is the language barrier. Uh, the advantage that we have last year is that uh, almost at the same time that we get information in English, uh, the government uh, tried to have the same information in Spanish. Uh, I think that was uh, very good for my community, but also uh, when you hear at the level um, federal that you are attacking for the last administration, uh, it's, a, it's not only not have insurance, but it's also the fair to get deported if you um, try to get access to medicine or to hospital or something. That is why my community was affected a lot or the, the proportion was uh, more than another communities uh, because they, they were afraid to get help. If I could also add, um, I think another uh, barrier or kind of another contributor, just the disparities or the differences that existed in like literacy or education. I think that there was a lot of misinformation that was going that was going around um, regarding how is the uh, virus contracted, who is safe, who is not safe, how to protect yourself from it. Is it real? Is it not real? And I think that that also impacted a lot of the people who we, the uh, certain communities, I think, were being targeted with um, incorrect information about how to keep themselves safe. Um, and I think that that also led to some um, more disparate like outcomes that were seen. And also adding on to that, just the effect of discrimination, the effect of racism in society as well, and how that's contributed to the uh, to uh, individual's ability to believe what they are hearing from higher up authorities or from the media. Like, um, I think there's a level of, of mistrust that exists as well um, that also should be acknowledged when it comes to kind of the differences in outcomes and the ways that this pandemic has affected certain communities over others. Yeah, and I would also add um, kind of the way that different groups, different folks have been able to kind of control their exposure, I think is another um, social determinant of health in a way, sort of thinking about employment and the ability to be um, kind of have some flexibility with um, your COVID exposure um, res resulting from your employment as well. Yeah, these are all great points just about how the history of racism and structural inequalities have affected um, not just COVID-19, but all, all health disparities that kind of exist in the US today. Um, so in that, in what ways can our current efforts around COVID-19 care, testing and vaccines be better informed by the role of medical racism and other social contributors of health historically? And again, open it up to all, all four of you. Um. I would start by saying that too often we pile populations under their same umbrella, right? So speaking from my community, the Latinx community, we're 21 um, nations. And we're typically, you know, under the same roof of Hispanic. There is Afro-Latins, there's indigenous, there are white Latinos, also Latinx who have privileges. So, when we pile people and we don't look at the granular level of what are specific barriers for each of those countries, there's people who come from countries that have trauma because there's civil conflicts or, you know, they're refugees, you know, they cross um, the border looking for a better life. So we have to look at a specific populations before just making blanket policy or statements. Um, I think historically, marginalized populations have had the answers of all their issues and um, in my opinion we haven't gone to the point where we can address them because they are not at the table they're not sitting there where i'm what happens is people uh in a very paternalistic way think they know what people need instead of going to the actual source right so we talk about the population but we don't talk to them so to be effective long-term policy that's gonna change the landscape of what's happening, which was before, and this is just a crisis, 
we have to have people making decisions who are members, who are have been affected the most, have knowledge about their community, making, dictating those decisions. Right now, there's not a lot of representation. So um, the stakeholders have to be there and what they decide has to be implemented. I think representation, oh. No, that's fine. Okay. I think representation is like is so key and so important in uh, making sure that we are actually creating sustainable uh, policy and making sustainable change. And so whether that be from the level of stakeholders or even to the level of people on the ground work doing, um, you know, implementing the interventions. Um, I think that community members need to see people who look like them, who share their lived experiences. I think there's a lot of talk and we've seen it on social media. We've seen it kind of in the headlines talking about certain communities, you know, you know, they don't trust the medical system or they have, you know, issues with mistrust. And I think oftentimes it puts the onus or it puts the blame on the communities um, for having, you know, for not being able to trust rather than these institutions becoming trustworthy. Um, and so I think, you know, that needs to come with having people who are trustworthy in these positions of power, you know, whether that be the, the folks who are doing the COVID testing, the folks who are uh, providing education, the folks who are uh, giving, administering vaccines. I think we need to see people who look um, like those we want to help and like the communities that we want to uh, mitigate the disparities that we're seeing. Um, that is something that can help a lot of my community. If they, uh, they saw uh, people who look like them, who is taking the vaccine, who is taking care, who is taking all the information that they need and they just spread the word. But as of at the same time, it's hard for my community to trust. And the government went last year, I guess was about this time, uh, they saw on the news, the uh, ICE detention centers forced sterilization procedures on immigrants, women. How my community, will be trust on the government, even on the medicine, when they, the, the same medicine is, is, is making all this for my community. It's hard because I try to explain my people and they say, no, they want to kill us. They want to do something on us. We don't know how it's going to work. I want to wait maybe one year to saw if you is working or not. It's hard to explain to my community when they know what happened last year. So I can see that we are essentials community, but at the same time, we are disposables. Okay, and then for community-led efforts moving forward, can you each describe one community-led effort um, in the communities with which you work that have increased access to COVID-19 care, testing, or vaccines over the past year? I'm going to be able to start. So uh, with SNMA, we've been able to partner with um, the National Medical Association. So that is the professional uh, tier of our organization and their local chapters here. And they've been providing uh, free COVID testing in the communities on Saturdays um, at different locations that are right in the heart of the community. Um, and so we've been at St. Joseph's Church. We've and at Hillside High School uh, doing COVID tests and also providing like um, kits of uh, produce for families as well, information about uh, where the families can acquire resources and overall education about um, the pandemic, the virus um, and how to keep themselves safe. And more recently we started doing uh, community vaccine clinics as well. And um, kind of run by um, a lot of the physicians who are part of this organization and the medical students both at Duke and at UNC have been able to 
joint efforts in vaccinating the community. And it's honestly just been really, really uh, heartwarming um, to see a lot of the community coming out getting vaccinated. So that's been awesome. Yeah, I can share some of the work that um, Greenlight has done around um, town halls. And I have Dr. Edith to thank for a lot of her participation in these as well. But um, we've been working with community-based organizations to, um, to share a lot of the information that um, was created by NCDHHS and kind of building on that. We've um, framed a lot of our work around community concerns. So we've heard, you know, 10 or 12 really specific concerns from different communities about the vaccines and have been working with community-based organizations to host these, these town halls um, where we, you know, have Zooms and uh, kind of op open areas for folks to come and um, listen to experts. We have kind of a growing community of um, local and national um, health experts, as well as community leaders uh, that represent a diverse um, diverse uh, backgrounds who can really communicate uh, with, with folks in the community. Um, last year, I was working with La Semilla and Cura Americas, uh, trying to reach the people who need uh, the test for the COVID and also uh, give you information about where they can find uh, supplies if you, they needed uh, for health or food or something like that. So this year I am working by myself uh, with my community. If I go to the flea market, I try to give you information there, uh, laundries, uh, Mexican stores. Uh, the, so the social me media works very well, uh, but also I, I guess it's, uh, it has two points because they can reach bad information that they don't need it because they saw that it's a chip, it's something that is gonna kill you, something like that. And then you try to cover this information, but that, that is the way. But also I, I want to mention this. We need to inform our people depending on the level of the education. Because maybe you can translate uh, at that is working very well with English population, but it's not the same for us. It's not the same for arguments who is on document, who maybe uh, has a lot of problems at home, violence, or for people who work on the farmers, it's not the same they don't understand at the same level. So we have to reach this community with, the, with people who speak at the same level that they are, and they can understand why it's important to vaccinate, why it's important to get a COVID test if you, they need it, why it's important to go to the doctor if you, they feel sick. Otherwise, Sincerely, you can spend millions of dollars, but it's only to cover that. I already did the job because I sent this information to the media, to the newspaper, uh, television, and I'm done because the information is there. No. Uh, so all the, all the organization that is working with this have to understand that they have to go where is the community. The community never go to the offices. Why? Because we don't know that we have the right, that we have the, this organization has this uh, resources or something like that. We have to change how, how to work with my community. It's totally different. So just to follow up on both Carly and Griselda's, I've been I've, I've been lucky to work with Greenlight, where I was able to I've been able to engage with different organizations all throughout um, North Carolina, and in groups where there's uh, farmer workers, uh, school uh, churches, and try to assess where are those concerns and those gaps in knowledge from a place of humility. I talk to the leaders; they have the trust of their community. I ask what are the most common concerns and I don't, I don't present myself as an expert. I present myself as a facilitator who happens to have information. And like Griselda says, I, I try to meet them where they are. Um, very humbly, I would, lead, I would let that leader 
lead that conversation. It's a short presentation. We made it into some information from the health department, but honestly, a lot of it is very complex language. So I end up making a lot of content myself where I simplify it and to put it in like metaphors and terms that lay persons, you know, would understand. I want, I do a lot of listening and in a non-judgmental way, like I said, my, the leaders are here and I'm here. I'm sitting at the table where they are, but I'm a guest. So I try to approach it in a culturally sensitive way. Um, I, I share my presentations with community health workers. They, they've been very positive feedback about the way I relay my information. I've made networks with people who later on ask me for all sorts of questions and I'm always open to those conversations. But I would say language and information in real time is power. And sadly, like Griselda says, there's very few things that you find online that are culturally sensitive that one can follow in a couple of sentences to you know, relay information. So my role has been as um, facilitating those conversations and information with people and also gathering what, what's needed in the community. Um, I try to pull people um, at the conversation. I was very lucky that uh, Griselda agreed to come to this panel. I think in these forums, we should always have members of the group that can speak you know, in, from the experiences because I assume or I can do some observations, but there's the, the real life experience that we need to connect with to get accurate information. And in my very privileged position, I try to bring my people where there's a forum that they can be heard and hopefully they would listen to those things that they've been saying for decades. And maybe this crisis would lead for them to, we could elevate their voices. So um, I've been lucky to be welcome in a lot of spaces with a lot of humility. I've learned a lot and I look up to all this community grassroots organizers who've been doing this for a long time now. Thank you all for sharing the important work you're doing. Um, I know I feel lucky to be here with you and hear about all your experiences. Um, and for our last question today, we talked about this, um, about outreach and language barriers, but moving forward, how can we ensure that structurally oppressed communities are receiving access to all of the COVID-19 related care, testing and vaccines that they need? I'm going to sound like a broken record. Um, you have to have the people at the table. We can be an afterthought. We can be the translated version of something that came up in English. We need to have somebody who creates that content from beginning to end for our people. And we have to have, like I said, different members. I've given feedback numerous occasions to officials about how this content from the health department or from the CDC, it's hard for me to read it in Spanish and I'm a native speaker with a, a degree, a doctorate degree. So if you want information to reach your people, you have to have a person who speaks the language, a native speaker, bring people from the community to look at that content before you publish this information to get as things, as you get feedback, modify as needed but you have to have somebody at the same time where you're creating that English content, not only for Latinx, but from Arabic, from all sorts of communities, having that person is gonna save you time and money because they, they speak the language and they can tell you that grammar, syntax, wording doesn't make sense. And you go to the website and it's in Spanglish sometimes when I read it. So you have to have the people at the same time where you're doing your English content. We can't be the second. We can't have like the translated version. We need to be there from beginning to end. And also uh, something that can help a lot is uh, try to add the legal uh, part and be specific because even for a lot, uh, American people or Nativa people from here, if you do, if you ask them, 
what do you understand about immigrant people and undocumented people? It's a huge difference. When you read something that all immigrants are, are welcome here or, and then you say, I am undocumented. Even people from here say, oh no, I'm not agree with immigrant people who uh, has her passport, her, get the visa, but if you are undocumented, no, 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 no. Even though if you that people stay here for 10 years and they don't have any status legal here, but it's a huge difference. And my community has to understand very well that if they take any, any the test or maybe the, the vaccine, they don't have any consequence. And, and has to be something, maybe go with the Justice Center, they, they make a, a lot of videos. Uh, they have people who speak Spanish and try them that they can explain. If they go to this, this place to get the vaccine, they don't have any consequence, if you, even if they, they are undocumented. And try to use the, the word undocumented because it's a huge difference when you hear immigrant and undocumented. I think I would just add on to, of course, like echoing what um, Dr. Nieves Lopez said about um, having um, all members of a represented community at the table from the beginning to the end of set interventions. Um, I think, you know, we talked a lot about access in the beginning, and I think having another thing to think about or to ensure is having these interventions or uh, these resources in places where it's not a barrier or an inconvenience for um, individuals to have to access them. So when I think about community clinics, for example, I know that in the beginning it was, wow, so exciting. We have these community vaccination clinics going on, but they were located in places that were very, very out of the way for a lot of people and therefore rendered themselves useful for only a certain type of population. And so, you know, in some, in some respects, it's like, yes, we're helping the community, but I think there's a level of intentionality that's missing when we do it that way. And so I think, you know, we've all been able to identify how a big of a barrier access can be. And so making sure that we're bringing the resources to um, the communities in need and making sure that we are eliminating as many barriers as possible on our end to empower these community members to engage. Yeah, and I would just kind of continue in that same thread that, you know, we need to keep keep listening and keep kind of iterating on the approaches that, um, you know, approaches that worked last month might be different uh, from next month and different from community to, co to community as well. And, um, you know, certainly as, as we've gone from kind of, um, as vaccines have become, you know, available and now more prevalent, you know, we still need to keep in mind things like testing and how we're talking about testing and how we share testing resources with communities, um, because you certainly don't want to then limit access to that. So always kind of, there's going to be many balls in the air for, you know, a long time, but kind of making sure that, that we're addressing all of them um, in a thoughtful way. We'll now open the floor um, to Q&A. So feel free to type your question in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, I, I do have another question. Um, like Dr. Nieves Lopez said, it's so important to always have members, to, um, of the members of the community at the table. And as Griselda said, we have to make sure that we explicitly are welcoming and creating safe spaces for undocumented people. What are other ways that medical providers and other healthcare leaders can build and gain trust um, of historically marginalized communities. Um, if I may start, I would say as a healthcare provider, I have to reach myself to um, community members who have earned the trust of their community. I don't expect to be trusted and it's rightly so because we're talking about history, but the present time, medicine and healthcare and science is as guilty as any other institution in this country. 
So it is my job to fix that by putting my effort, invest my time to work hard to have people listen to me. I don't expect just because I'm a physician and even I'm a member from the Latinx community that people have to trust me. That's very arrogant to, you know, living life like that. So we have to build trust by proving that what's happened in the past and keeps happening is not gonna happen with us. And this is gonna be over time. We are in a crisis, so things, you know, people are in, in survival mode. So they return, like they go back to the places they know and people they trust. So I am trying to build bridges in the community, sitting down, pulling my chair, sipping it and listen and listen and listen. And I can't say that enough that we physicians tend to think of ourselves as people that are very innately good. And we are part of the system. We are all biased. We all contribute even passive or active way. And we have to re-examine ourselves constantly because we're all biased. If you operate from that standpoint, I think people tend to see transparency and honesty, but it's up to me to make that happen. It's not their job, it's my job. I think I would just echo entering these spaces uh, with a level of humility. Um, you know, we might all innately in our own right look at ourselves as being, you know, great, kind, empathetic people. And especially if we feel that we identify in certain ways with the communities that we're working with, I think it's important for us to recognize that in our roles, we are um, inevitably attached to an institution that has harmed a lot of people. And so I think it is also our responsibility to acknowledge that hurt and validate the experiences and then create a safe space for listening and dialogue um, that will there, thereby build uh, trust in those communities. Just to continue with, I think both of those comments is, <laughs> with this kind of perspective, with this humility, right? And we mentioned at these town halls, right? Really having, coming at this not from the perspective of an expert, right? But really coming from this expert, it's just as another person here who um, is sharing something with you that they happen to you know, know a little bit about. Um, and so really just being present, um, being humble and listening um, more than talking and um, you know, doing, doing the work, frankly, just being of it, being there. I just try to be empathetic with my community. I, I use one, try to remember when I was here in this state 24 years ago with a four years old children and I didn't speak any English, any. And it was hard for me to try to enroll to the pre-K to my son. And I remember that one person told me that my son has to have all the vaccines in order to, get to, to go to the pre-K. And it's the same in Mexico. And I say, okay, he, he has. And she told me, yes, but here is different. Uh, he maybe needs more, but the problem is that each vaccine costs almost 1,000. It was 24 years ago. I remember that I spoke with my husband and I tell him that the, that year will be impossible to reach three or four thousand dollars in order my son get all the vaccines that he needs we try to save the more money that i can in one year and i remember that the next uh sequel will be star and i i tell him do you know we have to go go to the clinic we see Maybe we can get payments. We have to ask. 
when I went to the clinic, they asked uh, how, how much he earned. Uh, they were nice. I have to pay only $20. And my son lost one year of school. Used for not have the information that I needed. That is why every time that I go with my community, I remember that day that it was hard for the language barrier and for misinformation. So that is something that every day I try to remember me. You have to try that nobody pass the hard things that you pass. And you have to be, try to give you all the information that they need, even no, even though it's midnight. If you, they need you, you have to be there. And that is something that I want to tell you, all the person who are here, try to be empathetic with my community. Every time that you go to these forums, to this, uh, um, with all these people who has the power to make uh, accessibly things for my community, try, try to speak from how you see the community, not from your privilege. Let your privilege on the side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gisela, for opening up about that. Um, I am so touched by your story and I, I can see from the, the questions coming in and comments people are as well. Um, and thank you for so much for your time, your insight and your honesty. Um, we've all learned a lot. Um, and I think this is the perfect place um, to end our section. So thank you again. Hi everyone. Um, I know we're a couple minutes early, but that's great because Mike and I have a really great panel prepared. Um, and so we'll just have more time for a couple questions. So just want to thank you all for sticking it out with us to join our exciting session today on healthcare delivery change. Mike and I will be moderating this panel and we're so excited to have you here with us today. A quick introduction to us both. Mike is a doctorate of nursing practice student at Duke and I'm an MBA student at the Fuqua School of Business. Today we have with us a fantastic group of panelists that we believe will bring interesting and differing lenses into how the future of healthcare delivery is changing as we navigate the next normal. To be mindful of time and so we can also get to our questions, I'll be introducing our panelists. Today we have with us Abner Mason, the founder and CEO of Conseo Sano, Ben Money, the Deputy Secretary for Health Services for North Carolina's Department of Health and Human Services, and Kumbi Madondo, Director of Community Partnerships and Policy Solutions at the New York Academy of Medicine. Thank you all for taking the time and for joining in today. Um, for today's session, we'll be starting out with a couple of questions that Mike and I have prepared, as well as take um, some audience questions as well. So for those of you out in the audience watching today, please feel free to use the Q&A box at any time to let us know any questions that pop into your mind. And now that all we have all the housekeeping items in order, uh, Mike, why don't you kick us off with our first question? Thanks, Nina, and thank you to our panelists for joining us today. Um, so our first question is for all of our panelists. I'm draw, drawing from my own personal experience as a clinician. I've worked as an oncology nurse since earning my bachelor's degree 10 years ago. Um, a large part of my organization's research focus is clinical trials. The purpose is to learn more about cancer, how it's spread, how patients' bodies respond to the disease, and even study the damaging side effects of treatments. Structurally disadvantaged communities are underrepresented in clinical trials, often due to racism. I believe the first step to rebuilding trust is that providers must acknowledge past transgressions. And we have seen that many health care organizations came out and have acknowledged disparities over the past several months. And this is a vast improvement from where we were even one year ago. But how do we keep the momentum going? What's the next step individual clinicians, organizations, and hospital systems can make in order to form more equitable, 
relationships with historically marginalized communities. Um, since I think to make it a little bit more clear, let's start off with uh, Kumbi, who I think can really uh, kick off this section. Let me and un let me unmute myself. So, I mean, I I think that it is a good thing that um, many healthcare organizations are coming out to acknowledge healthcare disparities, and to be honest. Um, I think it's very unfortunate, but um, this has um, been as a result, I think everybody knows uh, more so lately because of the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and many others in 2020. I mean, um, now, uh, if you look back, it wasn't always common, especially for hospitals or other large care, large um, health care organizations that are sometimes um, funded by big corporates to take on some of the strong stance against some of these issues. So this is a good thing. But I would like to point out that um, in New York City, though, it's a bit different because in New York City, our Department of Health has really been a champion of addressing not only health disparities, but the racism in healthcare. And this was even long before the wave in 2020. So for the past few years, uh, the Department of Health has really been creating uh, neighborhood health action centers in some of our neighborhoods to address racism in health. So if you go to their website, you see that there are a lot of um, uh, programs targeting racism in health. And this is kind of like the same model that some of the organizations here in New York City have been trying to follow, including my own organization at the New York Academy of Medicine. So we've been really trying to call out not just health disparities, but racism in general. For we all know how racism is really manifested in the disparities that bedevil our healthcare system. But to go back to your question of how do we keep the momentum going? Well, for me personally, I would say just, we need to just keep on going at it and to call things as they are. If there's racism in healthcare, call it for what it, for what it is. The communities we serve know, and I think they would appreciate us humbling ourselves and say, you know what? We acknowledge and would like to address the fact that um, health disparities are born out of racism and that racism in its systematic structure, institutional and even interpersonal forms is an agent threat to public health equity and a barrier to the delivery of medical care in general. Thank you, Kumbi. Uh, ben, would you be comfortable going next? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Kumbi. I really appreciate your, your comments. And I think, you know, so much of the participation in clinical trials is who's the person asking, right? If you have a relationship with that provider and that provider suggests that, you know, the condition you're under uh, would benefit from um, being a part of a clinical trial, I think that that ask, because it comes from a place of a relationship, can make a greater difference than, you know, an email or a poster on the wall or some, you know, um, disconnected um, uh, person that is making the appeal. And I think so much of the relationship with the patient really needs to or really does come from a place of, of trust. And one of the things that's been found is when a provider looks like that patient and comes from that patient's community, there's a greater degree of, of trust, of comfort. That relatability is so important. And so it, it reminds me of the fact that you know, we've got a long way to go to narrow the gap in terms of the disparity of physicians, nurses, and other clinical staff representing the demographics of our country, of our state. So much of that goes, you know, when you think about the health careers pipeline to underfunded um, educational districts, 
you, you think about the fact that, you know, success in algebra is like one of the greatest predictors of the ability to matriculate through an academic program that would lead you to, to medical school. And there's such a disproportionate lack of access to uh, quality education across the state and, you know, advanced placement courses. Uh, we saw during the pandemic disproportionate access to internet. And we're yet to see, you know, how that will play out in terms of uh, academic success for this cohort that was disadvantaged over the course of the year where they were being asked to do remote learning, but yet did not have internet access or didn't have internet access nor uh, a stable family supportive environment to carry them through this year. So, you know, just kind of packaging that up to really say that we need to um, invest in um, a healthcare workforce that truly reflects the population so that when we do have needs, when we do have opportunities such as uh, the participation in clinical trials, we'll have those right relationships and the right people making the request. Thank you, Ben. Abner? Uh, sure, thanks, Michael. And, and uh, uh, I, I really agree with the comments of the two previous uh, panelists. Um, I would just add, you know, I think, you know, your question was how do we uh, take advantage of the momentum that we're seeing uh, now? And at first, I, I do think, you know, we should acknowledge that we are seeing some positive momentum. Um, I, we, people on this call probably know, all know this. Uh, our healthcare system doesn't work well for low income, multicultural, low health literacy, undocumented um, it, people. It, it doesn't work well for those people. And that didn't start with COVID. It wasn't working well for the last, you know, mm -hmm. 40, 50, 60 years and longer. Um, it's just that the combination of uh, the sort of national discussion we had around, around racial equity and, and health equity and racial justice in 2020, that combined with the disparate impact of COVID in 2020, um, it did something that is unusual. It kind of shut people out of their, their state of, um, of relative acceptance of a horrible system <laughs> um, that doesn't serve everybody very well, uh, and I say everybody because we're on the uh, we're on the path of becoming a majority minority country in in uh, now. Um, and if you add the minority groups uh, plus low income people and a whole lot of white people are low income, you take those two groups, you've got most Americans and our healthcare system doesn't serve uh, the people uh, that it's, mm -hmm. it's designed to serve very well. And so uh, we have this, ha this hopeful moment where we have, we've been sort of shaken or maybe slapped out of our, our complacency and there is a willingness to acknowledge we need to change. This is a moment where we can change, but it's also a moment where we could slip back into the old way. Mm -hmm. And one of my mm -hmm. concerns is, you know, and I, that's why I like your question, how do we make sure we build on this momentum and we don't slide back? As soon as COVID is in the rearview mirror, enough people get vaccinated, we could very easily slide back into the old way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to take advantage of this moment and this momentum and this energy, and we need to do some things. And I think. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things we need to do. I'll just focus on a couple. One, I'll focus on policy. We need to take advantage of this moment. And, and I think it's, we also are, are fortunate that there's been some political changes that may make it easier for us to take advantage of this moment uh, and have some policy change. Two, I'd recommend. One is we need to start to collect race, ethnicity, and language data. And we need mm -hmm. to require it for every health plan in America, Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, and commercial, and every health system. We don't do it today, even with distribution of the vaccine. This is 2021, and states aren't even, many states aren't even providing information about uh, race, ethnicity, and language information about vaccine distribution. So even this moment when we had a chance to start to do things differently, we st we were, were already kind of not, uh, not moving in the direction that we should. So number one, we need to require race, ethnicity, and language uh, data to be collected across all of healthcare. And, the, and we need the federal government, we need state governments to do this and to stop talking about it. We've been talking about it for decades. We need to require it. Uh, that's number one. And then quickly, number two, I think we, and this is you know, an opportunity that really the federal government and the state governments can lead. Um, 
if we both collect race, ethnicity, and language data, particularly health plans, and I'm talking, you know, about Medicare Advantage and Medicaid, then we can start to really uh, measure and have metrics to help us understand healthcare disparities. Because you can't fix a problem you can't measure. And you're not going to be able to invest real dollars, meaningful dollars, in problems that you can't measure. And you can't get a baseline. You can't know what's working. So uh, we need to first collect data. And then we need to require Medicare Advantage plans to do more of what they're doing, which is give them some flexibility to spend the premium dollar uh, in ways that can really help uh, uh, members, and, and I'm talking about upstream issues, social determinative of issues, everything that a lot of the issues we're talking about aren't going to be resolved in the clinical setting. We need to get, if people don't have food, they don't have clean water, they don't have housing, they don't have all these other things, it's going to be hard for them to have good, good health care. So we need to, to provide some flexibility. So I just want to commend North Carolina and Mandy Cohen is, from my perspective, a rock star. You guys did a waiver that allowed Medicaid to do something that Medicare Advantage can do now, which is to spend a little money on these upstream issues. We shouldn't have, every state should not have to do a waiver like North Carolina to be able to do what we know is right. So we need to have the administration and the states, you know, just get with the program here and, and provide some, some flexibility, allow Medicaid plans, Medicare Advantage plans, and I think commercial should be doing this too, uh, to, to, to start to make investments that really help members and patients. And, the, and we can't do that if we're not collecting data so we, have, so we know where the problem is. So I'd say those two things, one, race, ethnicity, language data, and then we need to, to, to allow the plans, in particular Medicaid, uh, to spend dollars on, on some of these upstream uh, health issues. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to hear all of your responses on this time being really a big catalyst for change and what systemic changes um, need to continue and are to bring this continual positive impact. Uh, we, Mike and I really wanted to flip it over now to a little bit more of the patient perspective. Given your past experiences, what specific programs have you or your teams put into place that have incentivized or encouraged folks best in marginalized communities to access care? or perhaps programs that you've put in place that haven't worked and what were the lessons learned? Um, as we heard from some of the panelists previously, having the trust in working with grassroots community um, programs and such play a big part in gaining that trust um, with these communities. So just interested in kind of your perspectives there. Uh, why don't we start with you, Kumbi, or sorry, you started last time. So why don't we start with you, Ben? Yes, yeah, so thank you so much, Nina. Um, one of the things that we launched early on in our uh, COVID response was a community health worker program. Um, the emphasis on the program was utilizing trusted people from the community, uh, providing them with, uh, with training and with resources to support folks uh, in their neighborhoods that have been uh, impacted by COVID and been asked to isolate a quarantine. Um, we um, equipped uh, those community health workers with uh, mobile technologies, tablet computers, hotspots, uh, to allow them to utilize uh, an initiative that we launched uh, in advance of our Medicaid um, managed care transformation, which is uh, NC Care 360. It's a statewide um, referral and resource platform. And so utilizing that platform with community health workers, um, helping people that um, primarily have been asked to stay away from work um, without the means of being able to support their families. You know, you're asked someone who's a frontline essential worker uh, with no sick pay to stay home for 14 days. Um, it really puts them in a, in a, in a rock and a hard place. Um, they either choose to support their family and get their bills paid um, by breaking an isolation and quarantine directive or, you know, staying home and risking the fact that they may lose their home and their family won't get fit. So community health workers connected people with resources. Um, we actually had, um, we utilized the framework of our um, Healthy Opportunities Initiative through Medicaid to provide um, food assistance, transportation assistance, connection to um, a primary care provider through telehealth, as well as uh, a COVID assistance payment uh, to help tide the families over. 
we found that to be very successful in the 50 plus counties where this program was implemented. Um, we saw case rates go down uh, and we also saw an emerging cadre of community health workers that are incredibly energized. We heard one on the previous panel uh, that we've now um, begun to deploy towards vaccination efforts, um, providing them with education, to educate their communities, um, providing them with the vaccine themselves and utilizing their knowledge and relationships in communities to get um, community members connected to vaccines, to host events, and to be really um, a vital workforce on the ground. I think that that's a way that our healthcare system is really going to, to be transformed by having that care coordination, that clinic to community connection through um, community health workers, um, uh, as well as you know, an effort around really addressing social determinants of health. Thank you for sharing. Um, why don't we hand it off to you, Abner? Uh, sure. Uh, one of the programs that I, I, I'm, I'm excited about uh, that we're doing is, um, is again, looking at these social determinants of health. How do we figure out you know, how to uh, I, uh, understand what issues people are facing mm -hmm. at, at scale and then address those? And so uh, my company can say, Osana, one of the things we do is we really believe that you've got to personalize the engagement. So uh, our healthcare system today is kind of, it's very impersonal. We don't, uh, we almost treat everybody the same. We might translate, but it's the same message translated. And when you do that, uh, you're basically saying who that person is doesn't matter. Their journey, their history, their experience with the health system, their level of trust for the health system. No, you're saying all the things that make you who you are don't matter. We're going to treat you like everybody else. We might translate, not well, but basically it's the same message. So what we've said is let's stop doing that. If, if, if Amazon and Netflix and the rest of our economy can figure out how to use technology to, to create a more personalized experience, I'm sure some of you have Netflix. I'm sure that they recommend different things to you than they do to me. Uh, and if you go online, if you if I if I put shoes, I'm going to get a different set of shoes that they're going to recommend to me than Kumbi Kumbi because they they under, they've taken the time to figure out who I am based on all my other interactions, and they treat me like I matter, like I've got a history and I I'm a real person. So we need to do that in healthcare, and that's what we're doing at Sarasana. We we've, we've got a technology platform that allows us to do that. But it's not just us, you know, everybody needs to be doing this. Uh, and and uh, it, that's the way you build trust with people. If you treat them like they matter, you can build trust. And so uh, we were approached by uh, RWJ Barnabas Health System in New Jersey. It's the largest health system in New Jersey. And they said, we want to know our patients better. We want to understand who they are. And we want to understand the SDOH issues, the social determinant of health issues. And we want to find out earlier when we can do something about it rather than waiting for instance till someone is homeless if we know that they can't they don't have money for rent this month and it's going to take three hundred dollars because they're low income it's not high rent their low income is three hundred dollars we'd rather know that and help them get the three hundred dollars than wait till they're homeless and then the cost is going to be much higher so our wj barnabas said to us if you can help us to reach out to our patients survey them at scale using technology we've got a we're doing it at scale using sms text messaging um and then get people to respond. And we had to do it in different cultures and languages because different people, it's hard to say you don't have money to feed your kids. That's not something that you just say to people and just say to anybody. You've got to build a trusted relationship to someone so they can say to you, I don't have money to feed my kids. So that's what we're doing. We're building a trusted relationship. We're getting that information back. And then uh, RWJ Barnabas, had, had partnered with NowPow, which is one of these SDOH companies, so that we give that information. We've integrated with NowPow to NowPow, and they have created, and they've got a network of providers in the state, on the ground, in New Jersey, that can actually meet the need of that patient. I think this is the future, and we need to do more of this. So I'm looking at you, Duke Health System. Um, Duke Health System and other health systems need to be doing this. And in North Carolina, you've got, a, I think, a, a great arrangement, which Ben just mentioned with uh, Unite Us. We work with them. The tools are there. The structure is there. What we need is the will to, uh, to, to, to use these tools uh, to, to, to help people. And this, what we're doing with RWJ Barnabas uh, is, is a great example. And I'd love to see every health system in America doing that. Great, I have a follow-up question, but Kumbi, why don't we um, have you join in first before I go ahead? 
Okay. So we are a non-profit um, uh, organization at the New York Academy of Medicine. So we try to build a lot of uh, strong relationships with diverse stakeholders in the communities we serve. So we partner a lot with the New York City Department of Health and other governmental partners on many initiatives. And we also have deep connections with um, some of the community-based organizations and faith-based organizations and coalitions across New York, including our community residents. So for example, last year in December, we it was really fast-paced. I've never worked on such a fast-paced pro project before, but we partnered with the New York Department of Health to conduct um, public deliberations with over 90 New York City community residents within three days uh, to try to help the Department of Health to decide who to prioritize for vaccine. So for those not familiar with the public deliberations, public deliberations are just a way for community members and not just experts or politicians to be deeply involved in community problem solving and public decision making on policies that affect their community. So for this particular public deliberation, the goal was again, as I mentioned, to get informed input about who should be prioritized for vaccination in New York City. I think an approach like this is very important because um, it empowers the community residents to kind of feel that they are, they are part of the decision making and we were able to really based on the results we find um, the, our community residents were able to inform the Department of Health in terms of distribution of the vaccine. And this is just one example. And I do have several others where we are currently engaging community residents and other stakeholders to address COVID vaccine hesitance in New York City. And we are also conducting a community needs assessment for one of the biggest hospital systems here in New York City, the New York Presbyterian Hospital. Michael might be familiar with that one. So I would say engaging diverse stakeholders, including community residents, tends to improve access to care because it builds trust. But lastly, I want to say that I think beyond just uh, engaging community residents, I would like to say that I think we need to share the data with the communities as researchers, uh, I'm a researcher personally, so as researchers, we tend to collect a lot of data from some of these communities. And some, to be frank, they are really getting tired and feeling used. So I would say engage and share the data with the community um, residents and empower them to be part of the decision making. Thank you for sharing that. Um, totally resonate with that as a researcher in my past life. Um, <laughs> so a follow-up to you all, the CDC recently announced a $2.25 billion um, package to address COVID-19 health disparities in communities that are at high risk and underserved. But based on some of the conversations that we just had, who do you think should take on the role of this personalized engagement to build that strength in the clinic to community connection? Should it be a private and public partnership or something private sector takes on first and leading the charge in terms of speed or flexibility? Um, Abner, why don't we start with you? I think that uh, it's hard for us to know what's gonna work because we're sometimes, because we're in an area uh, where we're, we're treading uh, new, new, new ground, right? We're, we're, so it's, it's a, these are not paths that have been formed by others and we know what works and we can just follow. So my inclination is to, uh, when you aren't sure exactly what works, it is to try to provide an opportunity to have many different solutions uh, uh, tried. And so I, I would prefer to not have it in either or, but I would uh, encourage us to, to, uh, uh, to really try to encourage multiple uh, solutions, many solutions, because we, we need to be humble and, and recognize that we've gotten to 2021 with the healthcare system that doesn't work so well for, uh, you know, the people we, we're talking about. So if we think that we're so smart that we're going to solve it in 2021, that we got all the answers, that may not be the best way to approach it. We ought to approach it with some humility. And that means 
you know, I would say, you know, encourage many different solutions. So we need to incentivize the private sector to, to get creative and, 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 and try things, you know, be, use some of the smarts that are there to, to try some stuff and bring some of the smart people, stop working on social, you know, uh, dating sites and come over here and work in the health tech space. There's some smart people that if we can incentivize them to use their intelligence and their smarts and their experience, let's try this. So we need to incentivize the, uh, incentivize the private sector. We need public sector to have more flexibility. Like I just said, North Carolina, you know, you guys went through this hard work to get a waiver. You shouldn't have to go through hard work to try something new. It should be a lot easier. And every state shouldn't have to repeat the hard work of North Carolina to try some new things. So the gov you know, state, uh, government needs to have more flexibility. And then there needs to be a, a willingness of government and private sector to partner, because sometimes the best uh, elements of each negate the worst parts of each. And you and if you, when you have public-private partnerships that come together, they really complement each other, you could see some really good things happening. So I don't I don't think it's an either or. I think we've got to try a lot of things and 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 approach it with some humility. That, that totally makes sense. Um Ben and Kumbi, anything to add? Yeah, I just want to echo uh, what Abner said that it really is going to take, you know, the best of minds. Um, in a humble way, uh, coming together and recognizing that um, while we need to keep the momentum going, we can't lean on um, strategies that have proven to be um, not successful in the past. I think government does have a, a policy role, and you know, we think about public health 3.0 really being that convener and bringing those parties together. I know at North Carolina DHHS, you know, we're very much involved in uh, preparing our application uh, for that funding. And, uh, you know, our intent is to really work uh, with communities, recognizing the fact that people that have a lived experience have um, a particular insight as to what those solutions need to be and how they need to be framed out. Um, you know, my background is with community health centers and community health centers, FQHCs, uh, by federal statute are patient governed healthcare organizations. So the board of directors is majority consumers. And that brings a great deal of insight to, to, to issues and concerns. And I think as we think about health equity, recognizing the fact that, you know, health equity talks about who, you know, people that have a disproportionately less uh, access to services, access to power structures, and that, you know, have historically been uh, structurally put at the bottom. And so when we talk about addressing health equities, we've got to talk about strategies that upend that paradigm. And the only way that we can upend that paradigm is to have people that are impacted by the paradigm at the tables making the decisions um, and really um, not only invested in the solutions, but driving the solutions. And that's why, you know, in my opening comment, I talked about the need for a real change, a real paradigm shift in how healthcare looks from the provider standpoint. But that also reflects how it looks from the standpoint of the board, the C-suite, all the way through organizations. We need to have an in intentional effort to build uh, the type of diversity that we need to have broader thinking and broader strategy. If we just have monolithic thinking and paternalistic thinking, quite honestly, we're never going to get at the solutions that are really going to make systemic change. Mm. I think I think Ben and Abna, you have said everything that I was going to say. So <laughs> I won't add anything, but I, I, I do I do agree with uh, the both of you that um, especially what also Abna said that we are not sure of what would work. And so uh, as both of you just perfectly said it, I also would encourage uh, a public and private partnership and not only look to one sector to have all the solutions. Great, thank you all for sharing. Let's pivot over to the future of healthcare delivery. So specifically the transition towards digital care. Telemedicine has certainly taken the spotlight in, in terms of bridging access to care, at least for those who have access to it, during the COVID-19 pandemic. How can our healthcare system continue to leverage telemedicine in order to improve trust in the communities we serve? What other digital platforms do you foresee supplementing the routine care that these folks don't ordinarily take advantage of or don't have access to? Said another way, 
how will digital, me digital medicine look, especially compared to traditional bedside medicine? Uh, Abner, why don't you start here? Sure. So I, I, I think it's I think it's exciting uh, uh, what has happened in the last you know year or so in terms of the uptake of digital health solutions generally and telemedicine in particular. Um, I think we're not going to go back um, um, to the way we were. So I think these digital health solutions are here to stay. Um, they, 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 they won't be maybe used you know as much as they were particularly telemedicine during you know, 2020 when you couldn't go to the doctor. But I can tell you, every, every indication I see is that we're going to uh, be uh, using telemedicine and, and these digital solutions much more. They are a permanent part of healthcare and it's going to increase uh, so, you know, uh, with, with newer solutions. So I think that's good news. If someone said that we've seen digital you know, telemedicine adoption, uh, it, 20 years worth, or 30 years worth of adoption happened in 12 months because people couldn't go to the doctor. So that's the good news. Uh, I think that I just want to say that one thing we need to be concerned about is letting the old thinking apply to the new technologies. And I'll give you an example. Uh, today, we're the you know, CMS and some other folks are saying we should reimburse tele, telemedicine visits that involve video differently than visits that are just phone. So, so we got this video visits versus a telephone. In each case, it's the doctor talking to a patient, right? I believe that we should let patients decide how they want to communicate. We shouldn't have the healthcare system or the government deciding that. We should be more patient centric. And in our work, we, we engage with, with, with uh, mostly Medicaid, but also other lines of business, uh, millions of patients now across about 25 different states. And during the pandemic, overwhelmingly, the majority of people wanted to use, a, wanted to do a virtual visit, but most prefer just telephone as opposed to video. And for low income people, sometimes they don't have the video uh, 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 tools, uh, they, they can't afford them, but they got a phone, everybody's got a mobile phone. Or, and so if we, this is an example of just, of, of the old way of thinking, uh, creeping into uh, the, the, the new technologies, uh, we should not let, uh, we, we, should, we should think of a virtual visit as a virtual visit and let the patient decide how they want to, uh, to, to engage. And we shouldn't have differential payment because if you pay doctors differently, they hire for a, a video versus a telephone, you know what's gonna happen. All, uh, the healthcare system is gonna just move over toward video. And, <laughs> and, and yet that's not what patients want. And for low income people, it's not, not what they're gonna do. So I think we've got to really be more patient centric and let patients take the lead and decide how they want to engage and how they want to use these new tools. And this one example I just mentioned it means that we've got to be vigilant because we're about to see the old ways of thinking uh, creep into how we uh, de deploy these new technologies. And wouldn't that be a shame that the new technologies, which could increase access, actually are limited and don't increase access because we let old thinking determine how we're going to deploy them. So, uh, I, so I'm, I'm encouraged, but I think we've got to be really cautious. Thank you. Kumbi? Um, so I have uh, somewhat of a, uh, a slightly different uh, take on this. So I do think that for certain individuals, especially with transportation issues, and particularly in the rural areas, have really benefited from um, telemedicine. And it may truly be bridging access to care. But I'm still not really um, sure if I totally agree 100% that telemedicine is bridging access to care for those who already didn't have access. Uh, because um, telemedicine um, comes um, with its own barriers of care, particularly among older adults as there are issues with trust and um, when I think of New York City, particularly, people live in small apartments. And so, again, there are issues of privacy and then, of course, access to technology itself. So we do a, lo we do a lot of work with older adults. And so here at the New York Academy of Medicine, we actually have a project where we are providing training to a federally qualified health center interested in conducting focus groups with patients just to try to understand their thoughts and experiences with remote telehealth visits. So 
We are hoping that the focus groups will explore patients' telehealth experiences. So looking at barriers to accessing and engaging with telehealth, and then looking also at their comfort levels and reservations related to utilizing remote care. And we are hoping that based on this, we might um, have recommendations for better engaging patients and community members in telehealth. So we are still, as I mentioned, in the planning phases of this project. But personally, I'm looking forward to finding out what comes out of this study as we continue to learn more about the impact of telehealth and see how we can increase access. Because at the moment, I feel access is still a big barrier for some of our community members or in patients as well. Thank you. Ben, any thoughts? Yeah, so, wow, it's really hard to follow Abner and Kundi on this because so much of what they said, I wanted to say. <laughs> so I'm stuck <laughs> my nose here. Um, you know, I think one of the core limitations that we found um, in responding to the COVID pandemic and, and really, you know, utilizing telehealth with community health workers was the fact that, you know, even when we had community health workers with, you know, mobile technologies, lap laptops, iPads, hotspots, you know, if they went into a, an area where there was a broadband desert, they were as disadvantaged as the person that lived in the household they were going to visit. You know, we, we still need to build out that broadband infrastructure. I know there, there's, there's funding available, there's a um, concerted effort at the governor's office to, to make sure that this happens. But you know, beyond the infrastructure, broadband needs to be accessible, right? Just because you got 5G soaring over your head doesn't mean you can afford a subscription. So it really needs to be you know, viewed as a public utility. Um, it, the other thing is telehealth, as Kundi said, needs to meet, needs to meet the needs of the consumer, right? It's not going to replace a face-to-face -face visit with a provider they trust. In fact, you know, I wonder how much telehealth can actually contribute to provider bias uh, and disproportionate uh, care that's provided. Uh, I, I, I think when I think about how technologies can be used best, I think it's really important to, to follow the patient journey, right? The client journey, the consumer journey. What about technology could make their life easier? You know, I think about like the young mom that um, needs to do like a WIC recertification visit. Right now, well, I shouldn't say right now, prior to the pandemic, you know, that mom would be required to, you know, go to the health department, wait in line. A lot of times they have to bring their child too because their child was part of the visit. And, you know, they may have a well child appointment that's kind of tucked in there, which is convenient, but, you know, they've got to take a bus, they got to miss work, they got to sit for a long period of time. And I think a lot of our social structure, our social service systems, you know, public health included, builds itself on the assumption that, poor people just have a whole lot of time on their hands because they don't do anything. And that's the opposite of it. So if, you know, technology can help facilitate that as it has with WIC visits during the pandemic where we're able to do telehealth WIC visits, which made a difference. It made it more uh, consumer friendly. We actually saw an increase in participation. You know, I think as Abner mentioned, that's exactly the kind of thing we need technology that meets the needs of consumers, not, you know, trying to use technology in, a, in an old pathway that is not going to be beneficial to, to anyone. So, um, you know, I, I think we're on the verge, but we're also at risk of going down a path that won't be as fruitful as it possibly could. Wow, thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, it looks like we're right at two o'clock now. So in the interest of time, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to stop here. Uh, but thank you. Thank you all. So thank you all for your takeaways and insights and a lot for us to continue to think about. Um, so Nina and I want to thank you all for spending the last hour with us. Uh, we want to especially thank our panelists from the entire event for taking time out of their busy days to share their experiences and thoughts. 
And I think I can speak for all of my fellow Margolis Scholar colleagues when I say, the questions we ask as health policy researchers shouldn't stop here. We hope you all will join us in our continued effort to ask challenging questions, tackle complex problems, and to relentlessly strive for positive change solutions. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful rest of, the, of your Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.